Government Gay, Alex Reynolds series, book one. Writer, Fred Hunter, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1997. Narrator, Eric Arst. Dedicated for Joan Edwards, who told me so. Chapter 9. An argument ensued in which Mother and Peter expressed their opinions of the situation. Mother was positively indignant. She believed that the CIA should be able to take care of its own problems without putting young idiots in jeopardy. She did not even have the good grace to realize what she just said. Peter, on the other hand, was of the opinion that since the CIA did not recruit homosexuals, I should not have allowed myself to be drafted into their ranks. In the course of expressing his feelings on the matter, he pointed out that it was perfectly natural for the CIA to press me into play since they'd seen me as just another expendable faggot. I was able to deflect that argument by reminding him that this could be the first step in the gay integration of the CIA. He wasn't amused. His response was a withering stare as he sneered. Oh, yes, one small step for gays, one giant flounce for the CIA. There was one thing on which they agreed. They were going with me. Now, this set me off because I didn't see why they should be put in jeopardy along with me. Look, I said, if we are all agreed that I'm an idiot for doing this, fine. But if I'm going to be an idiot, I'm going to do it alone. There's no sense in putting the two of you in danger. Darling said Mother, folding her arms across her chest. You are not doing high noon on location. This is not a movie. So if I may be perfectly frank, cut the crap. You're not going alone, said Peter crossly. He is awfully handsome when he's cross. The green of his eyes deepens and shines, and you feel like you could run naked through them. I let a laugh and said, I don't think the CIA could bear the brunt of drafting two faggots on the same day. Alex, he replied, his tone warning. I held up a hand to stop him. Look, I agreed to do this, and if you insist on going along with me, all I'm going to do is regret my decision. Alex, said Mother, and besides, it would ruin everything. This bogus Martin is just expecting me. If he sees three people waiting for him, he really won't come. Huh? said Peter. You know what I mean. He may think something's wrong, if he doesn't already. What do you mean? said Mother, her brow furry. I suddenly realized I'd seen her forehead crease more in the past two days than I had in the past two years. It made me wonder if our foray into the secret agent business would line her face. Well, he sounded kind of suspicious over the phone, I think. I'm not sure. He sounded funny, but he said he'd come. And there's going to be all those agents there watching us, so I'll be all right. I'll be fine, really. The three of us stood there looking at each other for a few moments, the disagreement seeming to crackle in the air between us. Finally, a smile played about Mother's lips, and I knew I'd lost. At twenty to ten, the three of us crossed the little patch of land known as our backyard and went into the garage. Mother climbed behind the wheel of our Robin's Egg Blue Honda Civic, which she said she had chosen because it brought out her eyes. While I flipped open the garage door, she pulled the car out into the alley and I closed the door while Peter climbed in beside her. I took the back seat. Before we left the house, I had retrieved a half-used matchbook from one of our kitchen drawers just in case I had to show the bogus Martin something before the feds closed in on him. I thought that I was showing some admirable brain power for having thought to do that. We went south on Halstead to Chicago Avenue, then turned left and headed for Kingsbury. There was a dead silence in the car as we proceeded on our way. The absurdity of being driven to a government sting by my mother did not escape me. Had we discussed the matter with the real Mr. Martin before he'd so unceremoniously fled, as if we were some sort of pariah, I'm sure that he would have at least attempted to veto the idea of my being accompanied to the site. Then again, it is better all the way around that we didn't get to discuss it with him, since the outcome would have been the same with the additional wasted breath. Mother hung a right at Kingsbury, the street which runs through old and new warehouses alongside the north leg of the Chicago River. 
Though we were silent, I'm sure they noticed, as I did, that the lighting on the street wasn't exactly on a par with the city's major arteries. A fact that did nothing to help my flagging confidence. In the distance, the Ontario Street overpass loomed a broad expanse of darkness beneath it. We continued slowly down the diagonal street until Mother pulled to the side of the road, beside one of the newer and better lighted buildings about a block and a half north of the overpass. Mother and Peter looked as if each thought the other should say something for the life of me. I couldn't think of any appropriate party words for going to meet a secret agent, so I said, Well, I'll be back, as hopefully as I could manage, and pulled the door release. Wait, said Mother loudly. I hesitated, and she looked at me over her shoulder with an uncharacteristic expression of foreboding on her face. We held this pose for a second, then she blurted out, You be careful, and grabbed my face in her hands and kissed me. When she released me, Peter said, Yeah, buddy, come back to me, and he reached around, cradling the back of my head with his right hand, and gave me a kiss. Without meaning to, my two loved ones were determined to undermine the little that remained of my courage. To save what I had left, I resorted to a mild form of anger, rolled my eyes, and said, For Christ's sake, I'll be right back. At least I sounded confident, and as any good psychologist will tell you, sounding confident is the first step on the road to what escapes me at the moment. I popped open the car door and stepped out onto the deserted street, closing the door behind me before I had a chance to have second thoughts. I started to walk south. The street lights on Kingsbury are a bit more far between the ordinary Chicago city street, probably due to the fact that nobody in their right mind would be out there late at night. There really is nothing to see, but the sparseness of the lights added considerably to the relative darkness. I say relative because the city of Chicago is never exactly dark. Even not fully lighted sections are still privy to the sort of electrified haze that hovers around the city. You have to get pretty far outside Chicago to find the total darkness of unlighted country roads. But for the urban version of darkness, this street would do much better than I cared for at the moment. And when I was about half a block away from the overpass, it crossed my mind that things were bound to get darker. I beat up Sea Shit Green. Pinto went by me with its brights on, half blinding me. Rap music was blaring from its open windows, along with some laughter. I felt it was being directed at me from the unsavory characters inside. Somehow I just knew they were unsavory. They didn't stop or even slow down. They just kept going, laughing all the way. As I continued on, another hymn was called Up From the Depths of the Church Going Upbringing I'd Left Behind. Jesus walked that lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. I found myself walking in time to my mental music. I reached the overpass, and as I had feared, this area was even darker than the street. Warehouses in various stages of disrepair border the three open sides of the area, cutting off any hope of additional light and adding to the general gloom. The Ontario Street overpass joins with the Ohio Fetal Ramp to form an exit and entrance to the Kennedy Expressway. The overpass spans a good city block, and the area underneath is bisected by a row of huge 60-foot-wide, 2-foot-thick concrete support columns, supporting the roadway overhead. The area underneath, not to be wasted space, is used as a parking lot. This lot was almost empty because of the late hour. Lights were mounted on each side of the overpass and between each column, but they provided faint illumination at best. Even while all of them were working, and on this particular night, very few of them were. My heart was pounding so hard I thought blood might spurt from my ears as I entered the more feral darkness under the streets. Overhead, I could hear the traffic speeding on its way both out of the city and into it, like a steady bloodstream, reminding me that life, if not help, was not far away. I wondered between the towering columns, wondering for a moment whether I should call out to make my presence known. It was possible that the bogus Martin was waiting behind me, behind one of the other columns, but then I thought calling out would be worthless since if Martin were here, he would no doubt see me eventually. There certainly didn't appear to be anyone else around. My lack of preparation for my newfound employment as special agent was brought home to me when I realized that I didn't know whether it was better for me to be plainly in sight or be hidden. 
I finally stopped by the middlemost column and leaned against it, further shielded in its shadow. There were only two cars in this section of the lot, both in such dark areas that I couldn't even make out their colors. I stood there trying to appear calm while my heart gave every indication that it was going to pop out of my chest. After a while, I was gripped by what it is probably the most common feeling of anyone who finds himself in this situation that I was in. I felt I was being watched from the shadows. I scanned what I could see of the area. One of the warehouses was in serious disrepair and looked as if it might be on its way to being torn down. It had several broken windows with jagged glass slicking up like livid, sharpened teeth. The other two warehouses still had their windows, but some of them were open. The feeling of being watched shouldn't really have bothered me as much as it did, since I knew I was surrounded by CIA agents, although I had neglected to ask how many there would be, but it was unsettling, all those empty windows staring down to me at me like great black eyes in the darkness. It suddenly occurred to me how vulnerable my position was. I checked my watch. Actually, it wasn't my watch. It was Peter's. I have a cheap Timex that I wear only when I have appointments to keep, but I was wearing Peter's because it had a luminous dial and because it was comforting to have something of his with me. It was 10.15. I was trying not to be even more anxious because the bogus Martin was late. I tried unsuccessfully on the phone when I set up this meeting, but I didn't convince myself. Then again, I could explain away as being late by the fact that whatever he was, if he was smart, he would be checking out the situation before he came on into it. He was probably one of the people I could feel watching, and that didn't help my mounting paranoia, either. In my mind's eye, I could picture that swarthy face peering at me from an unknown vantage point. I realized that I was in grave danger of creating a revisionist picture of the man, where every move and gesture he'd made on his one visit to our home was infused with a sinister quality that I knew in my heart he hadn't displayed, but now his move seemed all the more sinister as I imagined him out here in the darkness. The sound of the traffic overhead was interrupted by the faint sound of gravel underfoot. My heart went from unrestrained speeding to grinding to almost a complete halt. I forced myself not to peek around the column. I pressed myself further into the darkness against the column as the steps grew closer. The person approaching was definitely proceeding at a slow pace as if he were being extremely cautious. The steps had almost reached the column behind which I was standing and my fingers curled and pressed against it as if they were have light to dig firm holes into the concrete. A silhouette came slowly into view on the sidewalk at the end of the column and seemed to waver there uncertainly for a moment. I couldn't see his features in the darkness, but he was definitely pausing for some unknown reason. After a moment, he turned towards the column, unzipping his pants, pulled out his organ, and relieved himself against the concrete. When he was finished, he zipped himself up and stepped back out into the sidewalk. He looked left, then right, but didn't move. A minute passed, and I could stand it no longer. I inched away from the column and said, Mr. Martin? The bigger world around staggered backwards and fell painfully to a sitting position onto the fire hydrant by the curb. I came away from the column and looked at him in the next, the night haze of the city. I could now make out that he was quite disheveled, quite scared, and quite drunk. He also wasn't Martin. What? Stay away from me, he said, his thick voice slurring the words. I'm so sorry, I said, and moved to help him up, thinking that little plug on the top of the hydrant must be very painful to someone who wasn't used to that sort of thing. Stay away from me, he yelled, waving a hand drunkenly in my direction, as if to fend off my advance. I'm, I'm really sorry, really, really sorry. I thought you were someone else. Jesus Christ, you nearly scared the piss out of me. I thought that hardly likely, since he couldn't really have any left. He shook his head briskly and tried to focus his eyes on me. I was sure from the smell of him that he was not going to be successful on that point, but he seemed to focus enough to realize that I wasn't a threat to him. It must have been the look of confusion and chagrin on my face. I reached out toward him again, and he waved both of his hands at me and said, Get away! Get away! I can do it! I wasn't at all sure that he could do it, but he somehow managed to struggle to his feet and made it off. As fast as he could, swaying from side to side and putting out a hand to brace himself as he passed each column. 
I sighed with relief as he crossed Kingsbury and disappeared from view. Then I checked Peter's watch again, and it was almost 10.30. I really was beginning to despair of Martin showing up at all. It was proving that I was right in my hunch. He had re recognized this whole ideal as a setup, and he'd either checked out the area without me knowing it and decided against entering in, or he had simply blown me off and was sitting in his comfortable air-conditioned room somewhere having a good chuckle by, my, by himself or with his spy friends as, at the thought of my waiting out here under this hot, deserted overpass. I silently cursed him. I decided to give it ten more minutes. I figured by the, that time not only would I have withstood this beyond my own natural endurances, but Mother and Peter would probably be frightened out of their wits on my behalf. While the minutes slowly ticked by, I mulled over in my mind whether I should try to locate one of the CIA agents and tell them that I was giving it up. Then it crossed my mind that it was a little surprising that one of them hadn't come down from their roofs in the warehouses, if that's where they were stationed, to tell me to go home. The second hand of the watch finally clicked over to 1040. I sighed heavily, mostly from relief, and stepped out of the shadows. I walked along the cracked and broken sidewalk that bordered the parking lot, past one of the huge columns, past the broad, engulfing darkness of the next section of the parking lot. When I passed the second to last column, I was jolted to attention, as I was grabbed and pulled back into the shadows behind the column. An arm was fastened like a vice around my neck. Something cold and hard was jabbed against my right temple, and a heavily accented voice whispered in my ear, Cry out, you're dead! With one hand, he grabbed my shoulder, spun me around, and slammed me back against the column, my head hitting the concrete with a dull thud that reverberated inside my skull like the last echoes of a clap of thunder. I found myself face to face with the larger of the two clay people. Where's your friend? He demanded in an accent that I won't even try to approximate. I blinked for a minute. Which one? You know who I mean. I wasn't about to tell him that Peter was just around the corner. I stammered. I don't know. Never mind, he growled impatiently. Now, where is it? Where the fuck is it? Look, I said, but I was cut off as he showed my head against the concrete column again and took two steps back from me. If I spent much more time as a special agent, my brains would be permanently dislodged. This time it wasn't a knife, it was a gun, which he leveled at my heart. I want to know right now what you did with what Haycheck gave you. My mind raced. I didn't know which would put me in a worse position, if he thought I had it or if he knew I didn't. My mind finally latched on to one thing. We were surrounded by heavily armed CIA agents, so I didn't really have anything to worry about. Emboldened by this fact, I said, So where's your partner? The right side of his mouth jaggedly curled upward, and he said, Why, he's taking care of the rest of your little family. Oh, God, I thought, they aren't surrounded by the CIA. The CIA didn't even know that Mother and Peter had driven me here. Every muscle in my body jerked forward as if I was involuntarily propelled in the direction of our car. But the sight of the gun held me back. My thoughts must have registered on my face because the clay person waved the gun as if it were an extra head that was nodding no at me. Of course, it was then that my quickly atrophian brain realized that my position was worse than I thought. If he fired, the bullet would reach me before the CIA reached him. You don't need to worry about them anymore. He said his accented words dripping from his mouth like hot tar. They will by now already have been taken care of. You bastard, I spat. We did not ask you to interfere in this business. I'm not involved in this business, he smiled. You're here? It was certainly hard to argue with that one. Part of my brain was trying to decide how to proceed with this man who could certainly kill me if those damn CIA agents didn't get off their asses and get him first and the other part was wondering if it was too late to help Mother and Peter. How did you know I was here? I said at last. His smile widened, and for the first time I saw how crooked and rotten his teeth were, and one of the most alarmingly incongruous warnings, wonderings I'd yet experienced. I wondered if everyone in this country had bad teeth, he said. I was sent to meet you. Oh, Jesus, I thought. The bogus fuck Martin really had known something was wrong when I called, and why shouldn't he have? I thought berating myself for my ungodly stupidity. Why on earth, if something hadn't been up, would I have told him I wanted to meet him in this godforsaken place? Mother would have cringed if she had known how many times I managed to take the Lord's name in vain in one brief stream of thought. 
Now he said, waving his gun at me again. We are tired of playing these silly games with you. We want what Haycheck passed to you. We want it now. I looked at him. If this man was to be believed, Mother and Peter were already dead. I experienced one of those internal moments of truth that nobody should ever have to face in their lives. I realized that I had nothing to lose. I decided that whether or not the CIA thought it would strengthen their case against these spies or whatever they were, I wasn't going to give this motherfucker anything. I straightened my back, much as my mother does when she's affronted, squared my shoulders, looked this son of a bitch of a foreign clay person in the eye, and said evenly, I have already turned it over to the CIA. To my utter shock, he didn't threaten me or even shoot me right then. As I'd expected, his smile grew even wider, and he said, No, you didn't. What? I said, unable to hide my confusion. His smile faded, and his grip tightened on his gun. I told you we are tired to play any of your games. But he waved the gun again and said, You will turn it over to me or you will die. I told you I'd turn it over to the CIA. I said, looking down my nose at him. I was astounded to find that even when about to die, I didn't like being called a liar. Then we must say goodbye, he said. His thumb twitched, then moved to the hammer of the gun. He was doing it slowly, apparently enjoying himself. I tried not to look at the gun and kept my eyes on his. I thought maybe, just maybe, it would be harder for him to kill me if I looked him in the eye. His right eyebrow raised slightly as if he was surprised by my stance, but for my part, it was a wasted effort. His eyes were as cold and dead as the steel of the gun, as if they had looked into the souls of many who had gone before me, and none of us had been found worthy of life. He pulled back the hammer of the gun, and I heard the shot. Several things happened simultaneously, almost before the sound of the shot. His head flew back, and there was a burst of red, like a greasy miniature firework, bursting from the back of his skull. Then his head snapped forward. He wavered for a moment on his legs that were behaving as if they'd become rubberized, then dropped to the ground. If I hadn't been so shocked, I'd have cheered. I stayed pressed against the column for a moment, unable to move. In my shock, I suddenly realized that something was wrong. I mean, something besides having just seen somebody get shot. I thought I should hear footsteps rushing to the scene. I mean, he was dead, so I thought the G-men should be running out of the goddamn warehouses to make sure everything. But all there was was silence, a silence that scared me even more. Not wanting to make any noise myself, I slowly lowered myself to my knees. I inched my way toward the dead man, trying to stay in the slanting, darker shadow of the column. I reached out, took the gun by the barrel, and shook it from his hand. The gun felt much heavier than I expected, as if it by sheer weight. The weapon would remind you of its lethal nature. As quickly and quietly as I could, I slid back up against the column. Then I stood for what seemed like ages, but in reality was less than a minute. Pressed to the concrete wall, every professional association's nightmare. A gay commercial artist with a gun. Many things went through my mind, the most disturbing of which was the possibility that the CIA agents were not the ones who had shot this man. If that were the case, they were lying low because they didn't know where the shot had come from and couldn't come out in the open. Then I would have a big problem here. I didn't know if I'd ever be able to move. It also crossed my mind that if this guy had been shot by someone other than the CIA, that person was probably down here among the columns and my life was, as my mother used to say, not worth an hour's purchase. I started to edge my way toward this far end of the column, away from the street, when another shot rang out and nicked the edge of the column, sending out a little burst of concrete dust. That sent a veritable flood of sweat pouring down over my eyebrows, stinging my eyes. It was at that moment that I heard an approaching car. I quickly decided that if I could get the driver to see me again, perhaps I could get him to stop. I started to make my way along the column to the street end, and panicked when I realized that the car was approaching too quickly. I didn't think I'd make it to the street before the car passed. I tried to move as fast as I could and still remain quiet. Scraping my back against the concrete, my heart was beating even faster than it had when I'd waited here alone in the dark, because I was sure that I'd practically have to run in front of the car to get them to, to see me, and when I ran out into the open, I'd be vulnerable to the sniper. The car careened around the corner off Kingsbury. Just as I reached the end of the column, I braced myself to spring out into the open and was just about to do so when, to my amazement, the driver slammed on the brakes and skidded to a stop. The back door of the blue Civic popped open and Peter yelled, Get in! What? 
I said stupidly, which I think could be excused at the moment. Get in, said Peter more forcefully. I glanced to the left and right to see if anyone was evident, but could see nothing. But those damn staring warehouse eyes, I figured that running the few feet to the car couldn't be any more dangerous than staying where I was, so after a moment's panicked hesitation, I fled across the sidewalk and threw myself into the car, pulling the door shut behind me. My feet was barely off the side arc before Mother gunned the motor and screeched forward. I thought you were dead, I said, tears of fright welling up in my eyes. I don't think I've ever been so close to hysteria in my life. We thought you were dead, said Peter as the car sped down the street. We heard shots and then nothing. We thought we'd see you or the CIA or somebody, but there was nobody, nothing. We couldn't wait any longer. We just rushed in, said Mother in a voice like an exhilarated gust of wind. She stirred the car onto LaSalle Street and headed north, not much minding about the speed limit. Wait, what about the CIA? They'll want to talk to us or something. I said, somehow feeling we were going to catch shit for leaving the scene, even if the scene belonged to the feds. They'll know where to, where to find us, Peter intoned. He looked back over the front seat when he said this, and even in the darkness I could tell that his face was pale. We're bloody well not hanging around where shooting's going on, said Mother. What the bloody hell do they mean getting you involved in something where you're likely to get shot? I never should have allowed you to do it. It wasn't up to you, I said breathlessly. Then I shouldn't have allowed it, said Peter for the first time in his life, sounding more stern than my mother. I fell back against the seat. My clothes were sopping with sweat, and I had that feeling that you get every now and then that the world is spinning a little too fast. For God's sake, slow down, I said to mother. We don't want to get stopped by the police. Mother eased up a little on the gas pedal, but her hands gripped the steering wheel so tightly that her knuckles were white. What in the hell happened back there, said Peter. Did someone get shot? Oh, yeah, somebody got shot, all right. But it wasn't you, thank God for that. Who is it, Martin? I sighed and found myself curiously unable to exhale the strain I was feeling. It was one of the goddamn clay people. What? said Mother loudly, glancing back at me in the rearview mirror. Martin wasn't there. It was one of the goddamn clay people for the, the big one. How in the hell? What's that? Peter's eyes widened as he pointed to the gun, which dangled from my right hand. I looked at it for a moment, and in my present days, it took me a while to remember where I'd gotten it. It's a gun, I said. A what? Mother exclaimed as she stamped on the brakes, flinging the three of us forward. A gun? Peter turned his saucer eyes in my direction and looked as if he didn't recognize me. A gun? You didn't. No, I didn't shoot anybody. Where did you get that? Mother demanded. I took it from the dead man. Oh, Lord, said Mother, pressing the gas pedal again and speeding forward. It's worse than I thought. What was one of the clay people doing there? asked Peter. I don't know. All I know is I waited forever and nobody came. Then that foreign bastard came out of nowhere and had a gun on me. Well, who, who shot the guy? I don't know. He was about to shoot me, and he was shot first. I guess it was one of the CIA guys, but... But what? said Peter with even less patience. But there was a second shot, close to me, and the agents didn't come out of wherever they were hiding, and... And I don't know. I'm just so glad you're both alive. I reached over the back of Peter's seat and hugged him hard. Tears were beginning to run down my cheeks. Mother stopped at the light at Fullerton and looked over at us. What's all this, then? I released Peter and gave Mother a little wet kiss on the cheek. I thought you were dead. Dead? She said, sounding absurdly like Mary Poppins. I nodded my head and sat back in my seat as the light changed, and Mother made a left-hand turn onto Fullerton. Why on earth should we be dead? said Mother when she completed the turn. While that foreign prick was holding me at gunpoint, he said his partner was taking care of the two of you. Mother and Peter exchanged a glance as if each one thought the other might have some idea what I was talking about. Mother shook her head and said, Well, nobody bothered us. We didn't see anyone. Nobody? Not even a car. Peter added, Mother said, So we're all right, and you have nothing to be upset about. Have you? My head dropped back onto the seat, and I closed my eyes. I don't think I've ever been so exhausted, and yet, at the same time, I couldn't quiet my mind. 
That bastard with a gun had sounded so sure, and I couldn't think why he would tell me that Mother and pa Peter were dead when he was about to kill me, unless it was out of pure spite. That might be, but something was wrong. I could feel it. Suddenly it hit me. My eyes popped open, and I yelled, Oh my God! Wait! Stop the car! What? said Mother. Stop the car! Stop the car! Pull over! We were only about two blocks from our townhouse when Mother pulled the car into an illegal spot in front of a fire hydrant. What in heaven's name is it? said Mother. That guy, the clay person! I asked him where his partner was, and he said he was seen to my little family. Oh, Jesus, Alex, said Peter. He must have been lying. I shook my head rapidly. No, no, I don't think he was. I think I just misunderstood him. Don't you see? What? said Peter. The house! He's at the house! They don't. They didn't have any way of knowing that the two of you would be coming with me. They must have thought you'd be waiting at home, so the big one came to meet me and get rid of me, and the little one, he must have gone to the house to take care of you. Peter and Mother looked at each other. Mother's lips were parted slightly, and Peter's jar was firmly clenched. It was evident that they thought this idea made perfect sense, and neither of them liked it. I didn't like it either. I put a hand on the back of my mother's headrest and said, What are we going to do? Mother sighed again and scanned the four corners by which we'd stopped. She didn't appear to be looking for anything in particular. Her eyes just seemed to be wandering while she thought suddenly she reached down and unhooked her seatbelt. Wait here, she said as she popped open the door. I'll be right back. Where in the hell are you going? I demanded. Don't worry, I'll be right back. She jumped out of the car looking both ways and then hurried across the street against the light. She headed straight for a pole on which were mounted back-to-back -back payphones. One phone was free, the other was being used by a young black man having a rather voiceless conversation. The man glanced at my mother as she approached, then turned his back to her as if she wouldn't be able to hear the conversation he was holding at the top of his lungs if he wasn't facing her. Mother reached in the pocket of her skirt, pulled out a handkerchief, picked up the receiver and wiped it off, then dialed. She had a hurried conversation of which we couldn't hear a word, though her face told us that she was speaking very excitedly after a moment. She hung up and phoned and walked swiftly back to the car. As she climbed back into the driver's seat, I said, What did you do? She shrugged and said, What could I do? I called the police and told them a man with a gun was trying to break into our house. Both Peter and I smiled. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.